record and okay we should be good to go uh hi everybody um hopefully my internet behaves uh i'm jeremy he him uh and i live in bushwick and i am the north brooklyn uh, representative to the steering committee and also uh more importantly tonight an organizer of night school so i just wanted to say a little bit um i wanted to say a little bit about uh, night school and about political education and why political education is important um so i think fundamentally uh for those of you who weren't there uh nathan robinson joined us last week to make the basic kind of case for socialism that we are aiming to make to others and in some ways to develop ourselves. And one of the things uh, he talked about last time was that um, political education, one of the strengths of the socialist movement has been its emphasis on political education always and political education that helps us um, clarify to ourselves our values uh, the core values that we share as socialists, uh, solidarity, liberation, um, equality, com comradeship, um, to clarify our values to ourselves, to uh, think about strategy, um, how we think about the world, why the world is not organized according to the values we have and what are the leverage points we have to change it and finally to think about action um values strategy and action uh, what we do to change the world and to lead us into action um, in dsa uh, we really believe that being a good socialist involves activism, involves action. Every single one of us should be canvassing, talking to people who are not already socialists about our program and our ideas. Um, we need to move millions to action, but we also want to be smart socialists um, who share an analysis and who debate and discuss how we can best change the world because it is important um, not just that we uh, share a sense that the world could be better, but that we actually make it better. And the only way to do that is to leverage our limited resources and power to uh, its maximal extent. Um, and so that is, I think, some of the value of political education. And our hope is that people go from political education into the work they do as electoral organizers, as uh, racial justice organizers, as housing organizers, as healthcare organizers, um, that they go into this work with a deeper analysis um and new ideas as to how to achieve what we want to achieve um so that by way of a brief introduction uh, to poly ed and why north brooklyn political education is so important and you know as you know the next school meets every other monday to uh be a space for this kind of analysis we try to make it as welcoming as possible especially for new socialists who are first thinking about these ideas but really it's open to all um so tell your friends and uh <laughs> hope you enjoy tonight's session um with that let me just introduce our speaker for tonight and I'll get out of the way. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, Niall Reddy, 
um, who is a uh, recently alas um, has left the organizing committee of North Brooklyn, uh, much missed, uh, and is a uh, craft art organizer as well as a PhD student at NYU in sociology. Um, Niall is a uh, really fantastic economic analyst, uh, Marxist economic analyst, um, who writes about uh, South African politics, finance, and other uh, topics of note. So uh, let me hand it off to Niall. Niall will be presenting for around half an hour. Um, there will be time for direct Q&A. And then we'll break out into smaller groups where you can kind of get to know each other better um, and deepen the conversation uh, this evening. Uh, Niall, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks to all the other organizers. Uh, great to see such a good turnout tonight. Give me one second while I set up my share screen. Uh, can we go see the PowerPoint? Niall, uh, our excellent speaker for the evening. Uh, what was that? Sorry, can people see my PowerPoint? Yes? Yep, we can see it. Okay, um, let me quickly give you a roadmap for what I'm going to do in the next 25 to 30 minutes. I'm going to spend most of the time um, conceptualizing capitalism as a social system. So I'm going to be defining its basic properties, and then I'm going to be explaining the way that the institutions of capitalism structure how the different economic actors behave and structure the relations between these actors. So we're going to get a, a sense of the dynamic of capitalism. And then at the end, I'm going to quickly try to draw a few very broad conclusions from this, based firstly on uh, the, what Marx called the laws of motion of capitalism, which is to say the characteristic pattern of development, its economic dynamics. Uh, how distribution works under capitalism, who gets what, uh, the nature of the class antagonism, the, the contest between classes, the political significance of that, and then time permitting, which it probably won't permit, I'll talk right at the end about uh, the limits to the system, the nature of crises that we see under capitalism. So to jump right into this, um, capitalism is an economic system, which is to say that it's a social structure that defines how a society produces and distributes its goods based on assigning different roles and different um, rights to groups in this process of production. So economic systems for Marx are distinguished primarily based on how they produce and distribute what is called the economic surplus. So let me start there quickly by defining the surplus. Sorry, I'm a little confused at this process. Did the slide just change? Can you see this one? Yep, you're good. So the economic surplus. So if we think of this uh, blue circle as the total output of a certain economy in a given period of time, say a year, that is to say all the goods and services that it produces, we can define, we can uh, divide that output into two components. The first is what's often called the necessary product, which is to say it's the inputs that are used up in the course of production as well as the consumption goods that the direct producers, which means the people that actually do the work, use to sustain themselves. So in some ways, the necessary product is the cost of producing goods. The surplus then is everything above the necessary product. Okay, so any society that's able to produce itself at a given level of subsistence, anything above that is what we categorize as the surplus. Now, the basic idea is that any society beyond a very early stage of development, in effect, any society that's achieved set of agriculture, is able to produce more than what is needed for the direct laborers to sustain themselves. Okay, produce a surplus. And now the Marxist approach involves asking the question, how is this surplus produced? Who gets hold of the surplus? And how do they get hold of that surplus? And then what are the ways in which they're incentivized to use that surplus? And the idea is that once we can ask these questions, 
we'll be able to reveal uh, very important facts about both the political and the economic uh, dynamic of this society. So you can kind of uh, see intuitively why the Marxist approach, which is often uh, seen as kind of one stream within a broader tradition that stretches all the way back to uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, often called the surplus approach, is properly called a uh, political economy rather than economics. Because the questions that I just posed leads us naturally to ask about the role that different social groups or different economic groups, classes, play in this process of production and the relations between these classes that obtain. So in other words, these kind of social and political questions about who does what and who gets what is baked into the very theoretical foundations of Marxism and of the surplus tradition in general, which is distinct from uh, mainstream economics or neoclassical economics, in which typically the economy is analyzed as the interaction between innumerable different individuals who are trying to optimize their utility, optimize their preferences, and in which all of the action takes place through markets that are equilibrating through supply and demand, right? So uh, production as such, and the question of different classes and the role of classes tends to fall out of this analysis. Whereas for Marxism and related traditions, it's the kind of starting point. Every society has to produce goods, and the question of who plays what role in the production of those goods is fundamental. So if every economic system is defined by how it produces and distributes a surplus, what is it that is fundamental? What are the fundamental properties of a capitalist system? Well, most people agree that there are at least three things that are fundamental to capitalism. The first is that the means of production are privately owned. So means of production here means literally the physical assets and goods that are used in the course of production. So machinery, equipment, land, they're privately owned. So there's a certain group in society that has some kind of absolute legally enshrined claim over what to do with these goods, how they're used and how they're disposed. Okay, so that's the first feature. The second feature is that most of the labor that takes place under capitalism takes the form of wage labor which is to say what happens is most of the people doing the actual physical work go out on some kind of job market. They get a contract from an employer to work for some uh, point of time. And in exchange for this, they're granted some kind of uh, money, monetary remuneration, a wage, right? A sum of money for working for the capitalist. As opposed to a system such as feudalism, in which most of the labor taking place was labor of serfs or labor of peasants, who had some claim or some right to a little plot of land, and they were primarily working for themselves to produce the goods that they needed to consume and then giving something, some tithe or some portion of their labor to a lord or something like that. And the capitalism labor is organized through a market of some kind. The third fundamental feature of capitalism is that the production that takes place once labor has been contracted in this way is production for a market. That's to say the production establishments, the farms and the factories are producing goods that are then intended to be sold on a market and to generate a profit for the person that owns that establishment. Again, as opposed to a situation like feudalism or agrarian societies, where most of the production that took place was intended ultimately for the private consumption of the people that were producing. So these are the three essential features that define capitalism. Any society in which these things take hold, we can assume to be a capitalist society. Now, one thing that's initially important to point out is that none of these things are in any way unique to capitalism. Comb through history and look at any society, you should expect to see markets of some kind and you should expect to see people working for money. The thing that defines capitalism is that these three features become fundamental to the society. The economic system of the society becomes based on these three aspects, which is to say capitalist types of production become dominant within that society. A second important thing to note about these is that it's really the first of them that's in many ways the principal factor, which is to say once you get private ownership of the means of production, it kind of follows both historically and in some way logically that the other essential features of capitalism take hold. And why is that? 
basically because the process by which a certain group gains hold of the means of production, claims the means of production as private property, is historically a process by which the direct producers are, um, are uh, uh, dispossessed of their access to the land or the access to means of production. So what that means is you take away land from peasants or serfs and immediately then you create a supply of labor because the people who suddenly had their means of subsistence, their means to generate a living taken away from them, are now forced to go out and essentially offer uh, their labor up for the people that have taken the land from them, offer their, way, their labor up for wages. At the same time as that's happening, you're kind of getting the third feature of capitalism, because the wages that are being paid out to this group is now creating a market for the goods that's being produced in these new capitalist uh, modes of production. Right? So you're suddenly paying, you're suddenly requiring a whole bunch of people to reproduce themselves by selling the labor power and using the remuneration from that to buy goods. And that then creates a market for uh, the, the things that you're actually producing with that labor power. So it's really the first thing that gets the ball rolling under capitalism. Now, what we've effectively just described is the class structure of capitalism. And one way to think about how this works is that the class structure ends up assigning or imposing on every individual in this society a kind of economic strategy that they have to follow if they're, uh, a, a, in order to earn a living, in order to reproduce themselves in the society based on where they find themselves in relation to this class system or this property system, there's a certain course of action that it makes rational for them to follow in order to survive. So now what I want to do is quickly uh, lay out the economic strategies that capitalism imposes on the two main classes under capitalism, that's to say workers and capitalists. Uh, and to do this by reference to these very simple diagrams that you find in, in Marx's Capital Volume 1. It's called the circuit of reproduction or something. So the first diagram is for the workers. And uh, in all of these diagrams, the C means a physical um, stock of commodities, an actual stock of goods, whereas the M means a surplus of money. So what we see from the workers' point of view is that they start off with a commodity. Uh, they use that commodity to generate a sum of money and to purchase, and then use that money to purchase new commodities. So essentially what they're doing is they are selling in order to buy. The commodity that they start off with is what Marx calls their labor power. That means their capacity to work, not their labor, and we'll come to in a second uh, the importance of the distinction between labor and labor power. So they sell the right to work to a capitalist. What they get from that is a monetary wage, right, a sum of money, and they use that money then to go out and buy consumption goods. Consumption goods in order to live, in order to reproduce themselves, and in order to be able to pitch up for work the next week or the next day to start the cycle again. Now, for the capitalist, the economic circuit in some way looks like the reverse. Instead of buying in order to sell, we have a situation where the capitalist starts with a sum of money, buys goods, and sells them in order to end with money. So they're selling in order to buy. Now, in order for, them, for this to be useful for us to really describe what the situation looks like under capitalism, we have to immediately add a few complicating factors. Firstly, <clears throat> this whole process would be kind of pointless from the perspective of the capitalist if they were to start off with a sum of money and end with the same sum of money. So the first thing we do is we add this little axon here, which shows us that the sum of money at the end of the circuit is greater than the sum of money that they began with, which is to say they need to earn a profit from this in order for there to be any point in it. The second uh, wrinkle we have to add to this is that we're not mostly concerned with merchants, which is to say capitalists that go out and buy goods and they just increase the price on them and resell them. We're mostly concerned with industrialists, capitalists that are involved in some way in producing. So we add in the middle of the circuit, the process of production. So what we actually are showing from this is the capitalist starts out with a sum of money, they go out into markets and they procure the goods that they need in order to produce. And in the main, this falls into two categories. One is what Marx called constant capital, that's materials, equipment, machinery, and the other is labor power, right? They buy from the worker their right to work. They hire them for some period of time and they put them to work in a production process. 
the result of that production process is now a new stock of commodities. And here we've added the accent again to, su to suggest that um, the stock of commodities, hopefully, for the capitalist point of view, is uh, in some way an increase of value from the commodities that they started with. They then take these commodities to market and they earn a profit. Okay, so the capitalist is starting with money and ending with money, an increased sum of money. Now, the main thing to glean from this is what we're essentially describing is the process of surplus extraction under capitalism. So if you think about it, the commodities that the capitalist is procuring, the constant capital and the labor power, are essentially what makes up the necessary product. It's the wages that go to workers, and it's the amount that's expended on inputs and the deterioration of uh, fixed capital, the equipment and the machinery. Which means that the money that's left over from the capitalists, once they've sold the goods and they've paid off all their costs, it, which is in, in these terms is the profit, is the surplus. So effectively what that's showing us is that under capitalism, surplus takes the form of profit. And the means by which the capitalist gets hold of profit is a process that is entirely mediated through the market. Essentially, all they've been doing is going out, buying a bunch of goods and hiring a bunch of people, using the proceeds from the production that they then put those goods to work in to generate new commodities and sell it and hope that the amount that they laid out, the amount that they spent on all of this is gonna be less than they return in a profit. So the surplus, capitalists get hold of the economic surplus through a market process, and the surplus that lands in their hand ultimately is profit. Okay, so, so far we've explained some of the basic dynamics of capitalism, but we've left out one very important element of the story, which is sometimes called the vertical division as opposed to the horizontal division in the class structure. And the basic idea here is that what we find under capitalism is not that there's one unified block of capitalists that's exploiting all the workers, but instead we find that there are many different separate capitalists. And these capitalists are locked in some kind of competitive struggle with each other. And that fact, what uh, Marx called the iron law of, of competition, ends up being enormously important in determining how this uh, system operates. So essentially what happens is the capitalists involved in this production process now starts to take their goods to market. And what they, what they find there is a whole bunch of other capitalists in this market selling the same kind of good. Now the problem is if these other capitalists that they encounter are uh, capable of selling that good, of producing that good at a lower price and therefore selling it at a lower price, this is going to pose some kind of existential threat to our capital because it means the competitors are gonna start selling the good for cheaper and they're gonna start drawing away customers or they're gonna start capturing market share from the capitalists. And that's ultimately gonna threaten their ability to survive. Our capitalist is gonna find if people are not buying their goods, they cannot generate an income, they cannot pay uh, their costs. So what happens is that the competitive struggle ultimately becomes a struggle between capitalists to find a way of producing in the most cost-effective way possible. And that basically involves two things. Firstly, it involves what we could call cost minimization. It involves paying the least possible amount for the inputs that the capitalist uses in the production process. And secondly, it involves what we can call productivity maximization. That is to say, getting the most possible out of every input that the capitalist uses. So you wanna pay as little as possible for everything and you wanna make sure that you're getting the maximum value for everything that you're paying. Now, clearly this imperative for cost efficiency is going to have a major bearing on the cost item that makes up the, ultimately what is the biggest cost for the capitalist. The biggest item in their expenditure sheet usually ends up being labor. It's the fundamental element to their production process. So more than any other input that they're using in production, they're gonna to wanna to make sure that they are paying as little as possible for labor and that they're getting as much as possible out for every penny that they're spending. So this is gonna involve various things. In the first place, it's gonna involve, as we say, paying as little as possible. That means refusing any way they can to increase wages for workers. 
and doing whatever they can to interfere with the ability of workers to organize together to bargain for a higher wage, right? So driving down the cost of wage, paying as low wages as possible. The second aspect of it is it's gonna involve increasing the productivity of labor. Now, one way they might do that is uh, paying people to work for them, but then extending the amount of time that they're working for them without increasing the wage. Marx called this increasing absolute surplus value, getting people to work longer for you. Thankfully, the labor movement cut this strategy short to some extent, imposing maximum hours that capitalists can employ people for. And so the much more relevant strategy that capitalists employ today is not getting people to work for longer, but intensifying the pace of labor, essentially what we call speed up, getting people to work faster, getting them to work harder. Now, in theory, this might be a relatively straightforward process for the capitalists, if it were the case that the capitalists were lucky enough to be able to hire workers who, for whatever reason or not, shared a fundamental desire to increase the capitalist profit and to do whatever was necessary to achieve that. The problem is the capitalist is usually not so lucky because what is actually demanded in the process of labor speed up and intensification tends to be a labor regime that is extremely harmful to the, economic, to the uh, physical and uh, mental well-being of the worker, which is to say the kind of labor process that capitalism generates, or trying to squeeze everything out of, of workers, tends to be something that's just very harmful to workers' well-being. And this is where we encounter the importance of the distinction between labor and labor power. Because what actually happens is that the capitalist, when they go out and buy labor, what they in effect buy is a contract. They buy an agreement on behalf of some individual to come and work for them for some period of time. But what they're ultimately interested in is not the contract, but the labor itself. They're interested in the physical work that this person is gonna perform. Now, the problem is the contract doesn't fully specify all of the terms under which the work's gonna occur. And as we've just seen, the capitalist and the laborer have very different ideas of how this labor process should work out. The capitalist is mainly concerned with ensuring that the worker works to the, in the most intense way and to the maximum efficiency possible, whereas the worker is primarily concerned with just doing a day's work, preserving their physical well-being and getting paid and being able to go home without completely wearing themselves out at the end of the day. So there is this fundamental conflict of interest that capitalists and workers have in the production process. And it is this conflict that gives rise to what becomes the whole complex of what's called scientific management. Essentially, capitalists finding different ways of organizing and reorganizing production, such as that they can impose some kind of control over the labor process. And a fundamental way in which they do this is, is something called de-skilling which is to say they reorganize production, they bring in new machinery, they bring in new technologies in such a way that they try as much as possible to strip control over production from the worker. And this has effectively two main effects. Firstly, it, because you're taking the skill away from the worker and you're creating new technologies that in theory anybody could work with, you're making the worker much more replaceable which means that if this worker causes trouble, they try to bargain for more wages, you can just fire them and find anybody else out there to work the same machinery. So it makes workers more replaceable. The second fact of it is that it, 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 uh, it makes the work process much more structured by the rhythms of the machinery, which is to say the process of the way work takes place becomes structured by the technology. The clearest and best illustration of what this looks like is uh, Charlie Chaplin's, I think it was Modern Times was the film, and the really uh, famous scene in this where he's working in a production line and the production line is speeding up as he's working on it. So he has to nail the nuggets onto the widgets or whatever at a faster and faster rate until he literally cannot keep up with it, right? And this was a very transient critique of capitalism because this is, is what he was effectively demonstrating here is control over the work process being taken out of the hands of workers themselves and uh, machinery and technology being used in various ways that it can dictate the pace and the style of the actual work uh, that takes place. Now, obviously the increase in productivity and the increase in, in efficiency that is generated from this process isn't simply a fact of increasing the intensity 
justification of work. To a large extent, the way that capitalism becomes more uh, productive is by using more sophisticated and newer and better machinery. And defenders of capitalism and even critics of capitalism rightly in some way celebrated for this fact, that it tends to involve production processes that use more and efficient, better machinery and that makes us more productive. It is nevertheless important, it's a politically important um, point for us to latch on to, to be clear that the process of technological upgrading under capitalism, while it generally tends towards efficiency, is not a process that is in any way socially or politically neutral. Which is to say, capitalists don't just go out there and find uh, the best ways of producing something in purely physical or technical terms. Instead, what they try to do is find the best ways of producing something under capitalist conditions of production, in which a key, if not the key factor, is being able to control and intensify labor, which means ultimately that the kind of technology that's gonna be appealing to capitalists is not just technology that's good and better and more efficient on its own terms, but technology that facilitates labor control of some kind by de-skilling labor or alternatively even getting rid of labor. Uh, a final important point to draw out on this section is that what we're describing here is, a, pro is, a, is um, a situation in which capitalists are compelled by profit maximization. Now, maximization is an important word here. It's different from a situation of profit satisfaction. Right? We're not describing a situation where capitalists want to go out and get a profit that makes them feel good and gives them some income and lets them cover their costs. Instead, what they're trying to do is get the highest possible profit or at least a profit that meets or, or exceeds the kind of profit that their competitors are generating. Now, why is this? Basic reason is that profit is gonna be the major thing that determines the capitalist's ability to compete in the future because profit very directly determines the resources uh, available to them to increase the efficiency of their production. Because profit is itself, in the first place, a sum of money that can be used to reinvest. In the second place, they need to meet a certain rate of profitability in order to satisfy their shareholders and the bankers and the people that provide them credit for new rounds of investment. So what we're suggesting here is, is capitalists cannot just be satisfied with any rate of profit. They can't just exploit workers to an extent that they feel good about it. They have to strive always and everywhere for a maximal rate of profit. And what that suggests is that capitalists, much in some ways like workers, are not entirely freewheeling agents. They are in some ways controlled by and compelled by the structural compulsions of this system that tells them they have to maximize profit, they have to use the surplus that they generate to constantly improve their own efficiency at penalty of not surviving as capitalists. If they fail in this competitive process, they don't get to come back the next week uh, and, and, and continue as a capitalist. So their survival depends on profit maximization. Uh, come and check, can you tell me how much time I have left quickly? You're good, probably like at least 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes, okay. So I've gone as far as I want in uh, describing, I think, the basic features of capitalism and how it operates as a system. Now I want to just very quickly um, elicit from this a few general comments about firstly or what Marx called laws of motion of capitalism. So the kind of economic pattern that we see under capitalism. And the first important thing is that the story we've just told should give us a very important clue in explaining this graph. The slides are still being shared, right? We can see that. So the graph that uh, we see once we um, look at productivity, this is GDP per capita, output per every member of the society, over a very long historical time span, stretching back all the way from the year 1000 to the 1800s. Now what this graph kind of throws into relief for us is the very uniqueness of capitalism. Why does such a special social system totally different from anything that came before it? So what we see is capitalism emerging firstly in England in some point in the 1600s, the late 1500s. And immediately where capitalist institutions take root, you start to see the English economy diverging from everywhere else. 
productivity and production suddenly increasing at a rate that we had never seen prior to any point in history. And as capitalism then starts to generalize to other European economies and to Japan through the 18th, early 19th century, as we get successive phases of the industrial revolution, we get this uh, dynamic of compound growth, essentially this complete takeoff in the productivity and in the economic output that capitalism generates. So what it shows is capitalism is a world historically unique system in terms of its economic dynamism. We've never seen a system before that's been so capable of producing and constantly increasing the economic output of society. Okay, so why is this? The basic uh, reason for it is what we just described, that, so, that capitalism is unique in that it's a social system that gives not just incentives, but structural compulsions for the group that claims hold of the social surplus to use that surplus to constantly reinvest in making their production better and more efficient and producing more goods for the next cycle. So uh, capitalism is an extraordinarily dynamic economic system. And Marx, I think, rightly celebrated this element of it because what it did was it essentially got us to a position where future societies might be able to create a different kind of economic system in kind of post-scarcity conditions. It created the material preconditions for the kind of society that we would want to see. Another related fact to this is that it also makes clear why when you read Marxists who are talking about ec macroeconomics, who are describing uh, growth and output and crises, what you tend to find is the, uh, all of the action in the story that they're telling is around profit, right? Marxists tend to view capitalism as a system that is driven by profit. The situation in which capitalists are generating good returns, they're, they're earning healthy profits, tends to be a situation in which the capitalist system is working well, the high rates of accumulation. As soon as the capitalists stop getting a good return is when you start tending towards uh, periods of crises. So this uh, same reasoning also shows us why effective demand, which is a concept many people would have encountered reading other progressive economists' description of capitalism, tends to play less of a role for Marxist economists. And the reason for that is many people would know Keynes and Kalecki and these early theorists who talked about effective demand, what that was for them was really an issue about explaining uh, investment. The idea there was that investment was the component of demand, the component of overall output that tended to fluctuate the most, right? Other things like consumption tended to be more stable. So what we had to understand to understand whether an economy is growing from one period to the next is what is it that makes capitalists decide that they want to use all these profits that they're generating to reinvest and what does it makes them decide that actually it's not a good time to invest and they just hold on to it and they save it? Keynes called this the animal spirits of investors. He thought that there were these big fluctuations in uh, the output of capitalism based basically on whether business people thought this was a good time to invest or whether they thought actually a, a bust is coming and it's not, it's not going to be profitable for us. So for Marxists, this role played less of a, uh, this uh, concept played less of a role precisely because they thought capitalism was most, or capitalists were mostly governed by these iron laws of competition. Effectively, they had much less discretion over investment because they were constantly compelled to reinvest all of the resources at their disposal because if they didn't do so, they would suffer in this competitive struggle. So the subjective evaluations of capitalism, of capitalists play much less of a role in the system as long as, cap, as, long as competition is doing all of the work. And it kind of shows you why effective demand became much more of an issue for certain Marxists when they started to think that capitalism had reached some kind of stage in which the conditions of competition had changed. So this is the notion of monopoly capitalism, which is associated with these economists, Paul Sweezy, Paul Barron, is a big school, a big tradition of this kind of thought in American Marxist political economy. The idea was we've, we've reached a stage where these capitalist firms are so big, they're able to collude with each other that they're not subject to the same kind of competitive dynamics. And this has an enormous bearing on how we understand macroeconomic processes under capitalism. And this is an issue that I think is gonna become increasingly relevant in the contemporary period because there are a lot of economists who are arguing that we're arriving at a new stage of monopoly. 
there's a lot of industries and a lot of corporations that are finding ways of protecting themselves from the protective from the uh, competitive struggle and changing regulation and trust laws in their own favor so this uh, debate over the nature of competition and how it has a bearing on economic dynamics is and continues to be fundamental to Marxist discussions of the economy. I think I'm probably reaching the end of my time. I had a, maybe one more thing to say about class antagonism. Do I, can we go ahead with that? Yes. So, so what I would say that I think is basically most of it's been covered from, from what we talked about in the previous section that when we look at the capitalist process of production, we see that capitalists and workers seem to have inverse interests in this entire relationship, right? Capitalists tend to do better for themselves the worse off they can make workers. They wanna make workers work for as low a wage as possible and work under conditions that they're gonna be inclined to resist. So what we should elicit from this is, is a few factors. Firstly, that we should expect to see conflict is pretty endemic to the system. There's fundamental interests that are diverging, so we should see conflict consistently. We should expect that workers generally are gonna to try to resist what capitalists impose on them. They're gonna to try to shirk this regime of having to intensify and speed up the work that they're doing. That's a slightly different question of saying we should expect workers to become socialists, but we should in various ways expect workers to resist what capitalists are foisting on them. And the second very important um, conclusion that we can draw directly from understanding the nature of the labor process and this class antagonism is that we should expect this kind of conflict not to remain confined to what's happening in the factory or in the workplace, but to spill over into other spheres of society. Why is that? For the basic reason that this conflict is gonna in, in many ways be conditioned, the outcome is gonna be determined by what's happening in the rest of society. If workers are able to get hold of the state if they can promote politicians that favor their interests and those politicians change laws and regulations such that they introduce minimum wages, they make it easier for workers to unionize and collectivize, then what that's gonna do is shift the balance of forces in favor of workers inside this contest within production, right? So the, the political questions over economic policy are gonna have a direct bearing on this conflict between workers and capitalists. And that, what that means is that capitalists are gonna seek everywhere that they can to leverage the power that they gain from being in control of investment, being in control of production, generating enormous resources for themselves to influence the political process in their favor by limiting and diluting democracy. So the very profound conclusion that we can generate from understanding this process of class antagonism and conflict is that there's a fundamental tension between capitalism and democracy. A tension that even uh, with some Marxists gets obscured because there's this confusing matter of the fact that capital or, or capitalist modernity and liberal democracy seem to occur at the same period. Capitalism seemed to come about with liberal democracy. But when we look at the actual history, the process of how this occurred, what is revealed is that it's not that capitalism by its nature just gave rise to democracy. The only reason that we got democracy was that capitalism gave certain resources, certain forms of power to workers to be able to fight for that democracy. Because the same antagonism that we see in production, the same reason that capitalists have to fuck over workers is ultimately a source of power for workers. The reason they need to fuck them over constantly is because they're dependent on them in some way. And what we saw historically was, was workers able to use that, leverage that dependency into a kind of structural power that enabled them to promote democratic processes. But every society in which we see capital or in which we see power being transferred back to capitalists, we should expect that that's gonna have negative effects on democracy. And there is no better illustration of that than contemporary American society in which capitalists have been accumulating and bolstering their power for 30 or 40 years. And the consequence of it is not just that workers and working people are poorer and worse off, it's that democracy is in a far worse shape in this country. So I think I will stop there. Awesome, thanks so much, Niall. Um, Great, so I think now um, we've got lots to think about, lots to discuss. Um, we wanted to 
open up the floor for uh, some Q&A with Niall before we do the breakout rooms. Um, and just really briefly um, to establish, you know, a little bit of ground rules before we start Q&A and for the breakout groups, um, we just have some community agreements. Um, so just assuming that everybody's here to learn, um, being uh, nice to your comrades. Um, and if you do have a question for this portion of the Q&A, just go ahead and put your uh, put stack into the chat um, and we'll call on you in order. Um, and yeah, just keep your questions relatively brief if you can, um, just because we want to um, leave enough time for the group discussions as well. So I'm going to go ahead and see, um, uh, open it up if anyone wants to ask the first question and put yourself into the stack. All right, go ahead, Lee. Um, you might be muted, Lee. We can't. Uh, yep. Hear you. Okay, okay. Now I'm good. There you go. So, Niall, thank you so much. That was great. I I'm just wondering um, if you could little talk a little bit about that um, chart that you showed, where um, Britain and the English um, sort of uh, industrial group grew from the 1800 to the to the end of the 1800s, and um, isn't the situation with U.S. slavery and um, the cotton trade, um, you know, over 70% of the cotton that was created in the slave states went to England. And that was a, um, a key accelerator in terms of the development of industry in England, as well as it was uh, they were at the right stage of, of um, going from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, Chair, should I answer immediately or are you taking a few questions? Um, whatever you prefer, Niall. Do you want to do, I see there's one more uh, or two more people on staff. Do you want to do like three questions? Yeah, maybe let's do three. Okay, cool. So Isaiah is next. Hi, I just had a question looking at the graph and I know that there is like um, a trend of thought saying that capitalism is on its way to implosion. And I wanted to know if you could like speak more on that, that theory. Thank you. And then Josh for the last question. Hey, Niall. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question was, you said that the kind of primary source of existential threat for capitalists is other capitalists in the market. If that's the case, I'm curious why they are so hostile to uniform labor reforms, which presumably put them on equal footing with other capitalists. Okay, uh, thanks. That was a great question. So let me start with Lee. Um, Lee, I, I think what you describe is uh, accurate and extremely important in any history of capitalism, that in its early period, um, non-capitalist modes of production, and in particular slavery in the Caribbean and the US South was enormously important to the period of capitalist takeoff. And there's, and there's numerable different causal routes that one could trace for this. You were directly supplying a huge portion of the US, uh, of the English market in textiles. It was generating forms of finance that was supporting uh, investment in the early capitalist industry. There is no question, uh, sorry, and also it was, it became, it generated important export markets uh, for, the, uh, for uh, the industrializing economy in the UK. So there's no question that however you cut it, uh, slavery has been critical to capitalist growth in the early period. What I think is an important question for us to grapple with nevertheless, is distinguishing the idea between, or distinguishing between a situation in which slavery and non-capitalist modes of production contributed, facilitated, enhanced capitalist growth, sped up this process towards industrialization, and a situation in which capitalism was dependent on that growth. And I think that's the kind of theoretical um, conundrum that we have to um, grapple with. And while I think that, uh, as I said, everything that you described uh, proves beyond uh, really anybody's doubt that slavery and non-capitalist modes of production were incredibly useful to earliest processes of capitalist emergence, I would dispute 
um, a claim that were it not for these modes of production, were it the case that capitalism didn't have access to slavery, it could never have survived and taken on the forms that it did. And the reason that I would dispute that claim is that I think one of the essential conclusions that one can derive from the description of capitalism I just provided is that it's a system in which it's its own internal dynamism that sustains it. Capitalism does not, unfortunately, rely on any external sources for its survival, because wherever you can spread uh, a market-based system, a system in which both of the major economic actors have to reproduce themselves through markets, you get a system that gives rise to its own dynamism. You get a system that itself endogenously creates markets. And so what I think would have happened is if capitalism had taken root in a period in which slavery didn't exist, the ultimate breakthrough to industrial revolution, that graph I showed, would have had a much flatter uh, gradient to it. But it's not that the gradient would have been flat entirely. It's not that you would have been trapped within feudalism. Eventually, capitalism would have found the sources that it needed to create both the goods and the markets that facilitated further expansion. And the reason this is important is that it, it's uh, often related to a question of capitalism's vulnerability and capitalism's weaknesses. There's a tradition of political economy that's tended to believe that capitalism has these inbuilt tendencies to crises, that unless in some way it can draw on non-capitalist systems, and this is most associated with Rosa Luxemburg, that eventually it wouldn't be able to sustain the demand that it needed to keep itself going. Now, I wish that that had been the case because then we would be in a situation today in which capitalism would be limping and on its last legs because we're in a situation in which the entire world effectively, except for potentially a few African economies, are capitalist systems of production. If capitalism relied on external, on in some way exploiting the colonial world or exploiting other systems, it would be easier to beat. Unfortunately, my own analysis tells me that this is not the case. It's an, it's an extremely dynamic system, a system that's capable of propelling itself. And that's, that's the worst for us, because that means it's harder to take on. And I think that's a good uh, segue into this question of, of um, breakdown. So, um, and this is actually something that I wanted to touch on in talking about capitalist crises. Because I think it would be accurate to say that the dominant theory of crises amongst at least the political left over the last 20 to 30 years, and arguably amongst the academic Marxist left, has been a theory of crisis as premised on a term a lot of people would be familiar with, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. It should connect to this idea that profits are always fundamental under capitalism. So without going to a full-blown explanation of what's a pretty complicated theory, the basic intuition behind the theory was the following. And I guess I suppose before explaining it, it's important to note that one thing that I completely abstracted from in this discussion, which tends to be thought of as pretty critical to Marx's own economics, and if anybody's cracked the spine on Capital Volume 1, you would see that a lot of time and space is devoted to the labor theory of value. Okay, I've abstracted from that, and if it's useful, we can come into a second to talk about why I did so. The labor theory of value is a theory that's pretty critical to this theory of capitalist breakdown. Again, without going fully into the mechanics of it, the basic intuition is this. Marx believed that the only thing that produces new value, and ultimately, therefore, new profit, is living labor, people working. Okay. Um, now, what happens as a result of that is, as technological progress proceeds, what we find in production is that the proportion of production that's comprised of living labor relative to what Marx called dead labor, which is to say inputs, machinery, fixed capital goods, decreases over time. As capitalists are compelled to constantly introduce new and better and more sophisticated machinery, the value of labor relative to the other forms of capital that they're spending money on decreases over time. And what that should lead to is a decrease in the rate of profit eventually. Because remember, the rate of profit is not just the um, profit or the surplus that they're generating over what they pay to workers, it's over what they pay in total for all of the, of the goods that they're using in production. 
machinery inputs as well. So what that meant is as technological progress proceeds, as we get more and more capital intensive in our production, because labor is the only source of profit and value, the profit rate is going to decrease. And eventually it's going to lead to a point where it's so low and it's not recovering that you're going to get uh, successive crises such that it's not just one crisis that leads to a slump, but that the economy is not capable of recovering from that slump properly. And a few years down the line, you get another slump. So capitalism is in this breakdown moment. It's not just a boom and bust phase, it's trending secularly downwards, okay? And you can see why this uh, theory was extremely critical for political debates on the left, because the notion of a breakdown was a cornerstone of why big sections of the left said that the role of socialists is to hold a revolutionary banner high and essentially to prepare ourselves for a moment in which we're going to see capitalism entering a crisis from which it cannot recover. That however unpropitious the current conditions might look for revolutionary rupture, eventually capitalism tending in, um, ineluctably towards a point in which it's just going to break down. And what we need to do is be consistent in saying the revolutionary rupture is coming and prepare the proletariat, our working class, for this moment. The problem is that this theory, I think, just has no validity. And the first reason for it is that the labor theory of value on which it rests is a theory that just has, that is kind of scientifically bankrupt. It's internally inconsistent. It's been proved above all by Piero Sraffa to be a theory that's irrelevant, that cannot, that doesn't actually show us anything new about the world. And most uh, uh, critically for this theory is that there was a mathematical critique of it launched in 1961 by a Japanese economist um, called um, Moriko Okishio. His, his work is called the Okishio Theorem. And in very simple terms, what Okishio Theorem shows is that any type of new technology that is rational for a capitalist to adopt will in the long run lead not to a decrease but an increase in the rate of profit. Akisha wrote this paper in 1961 and it should have been the last word on the theory of breakdown linked to a tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Unfortunately it has been the case. There's a whole lot of Marxist economists who continue to defend the theory. The trouble is when you look at what's happening each of these Marxist economists has never managed to convince anybody except for one or two followers. So we don't have one theory of prices or one theory of the labor, of, of, of the labor theory of value. We have 20 or 30 different ones, each defended by one or two different people. So of course, there's a debate to be had here. People can reach diverging conclusions, but to my mind, it's an extraordinary risk for the socialist movement to hinge so much of its strategy on a theory about how capitalism is operating that seems to be beset by serious flaws, serious weaknesses, that I don't think is an, an accurate rendering of, of what's actually happening. Okay, really quickly on the last point, the theory of uh, what's existential to the capitalist. Um, and if I can clarify that the question was, why would they oppose increases in the minimum wage or something if it meant that all capitalists would so I think at a kind of immediate level, capitalists have to survive in this competition against other capitalists. But in general, they understand that the more profits for them, uh, the more that they can accrue power in this bargaining process with labor, the better off they're, that they're gonna be. So even if it's the case that the laws that labor is able to pass are something that constrains train all capitalists, not just one capitalist. All capitalists have to pay the minimum wage, not just one capitalist. It's still the case that by virtue of having to do that, they, have to, they end up having to pay higher wages than they would otherwise have done. They end up having to bargain with workers in a less favorable position. Because by virtue of labor favorable legislation, workers are now less dependent on them. And that's in general a situation they want to resist. It has been the case that in certain periods, you've had a group of capitalists that have been kind of prepared to say, okay, we might concede on certain questions in exchange for other political opportunities that we're able to get hold of. There's one interpret interpretation of the New Deal that goes something like this. There's a certain group of capitalists that were less threatened by the labor laws that Roosevelt and other people were pushing, 
And what it meant was they could construct a kind of new coalition with labor. They could accept these labor laws because they were able to pay slightly higher wages. The competitors who couldn't would go out of business. And because they could construct a new coalition with labor and with Roosevelt, it gave them all sort of new access to the capitalist state. So there are complex political questions that play into this um, dynamic. But in general, the pattern that we see is that anything that's good for capitalists is something that, um, anything that's good for workers is that capitalists, is, is capitalists want to resist it. Great. And then it looks like we have two more questions, which should take us right up to the moment that we need uh, to do the breakout groups. So we have Jeremy first and then Ashley for the last two questions. Hi, uh, I'm hoping my internet is a little better. I'm turning off the video. Can, yeah, is it okay? Um, so Niall, I, well, two things. Um, one, I thought your, what you just said about crisis and kind of the problematic, um, almost kind of political laziness that uh, comes into play if you believe the final crisis is coming. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. On the other hand, uh, do you think that the kind of regular incidents of serious crises in capitalism um, is important for the theory and is important for kind of political thinking and political strategy. Um, I'd just be curious about your perspective on that. And the second thing is, um, I see from your presentation, uh, a lot of kind of points for socialist strategy that come out of it, like the importance, the idea that there's an objective antagonism in the workplace that socialists can help to organize and push um, the way in which, you know, bosses and workers have different kinds of interests. Um, also the, what you said about democracy in the state. I was wondering also about sort of, um, uh, sort of one thing that socialists fight for a lot, like decommodification. Like you didn't talk too much about um, kind of a lot of the things that we as contemporary socialists talk a lot about, like healthcare, housing, sort of the, the ways in which um, uh, working class people reproduce their lives. So I wonder where, um, the places for that in this analysis and why socialists are so focused on sort of decommodifying um, parts of the uh, essential needs of people. Cool, and Ashley, you wanna ask your question? Sure. Um, I wanted to throw in like a somewhat, well, it's not an annoying question that I often get, but in reference to kind of like the, the drastic increase in production and your point that capitalism kind of set the pre-material conditions for the kind of lives that people will want to live, this is kind of a, a counterpoint I often get from capitalists or, you know, people who want to argue in favor of capitalism. So my question is, do, do you think, in your opinion, does the absence of capitalist production machine allow for a socialist society that can maintain a 21st century idea of advancement and comfort in living? Or does a socialist economy inevitably inevitably kind of result in a slowdown of production and a drastic change in living um, for sake of convincing people or not. Thank you. Is that a me? Should I respond? Okay, thanks. Great questions again. And, and Jeremy, yeah, I mean, I'm very glad you asked that because that's actually kind of where I'd, I'd wanted to initially to go with this because I was kind of actually thinking about it today that it's a, it feels like a strange situation for me reflecting across very different political experiences I've had, where my kind of initiation into socialist politics in parties that today, I guess, would be viewed as kind of old left or, or one way or another. Uh, this conversation that we've been having about crises and whether crises are inherent in the nature of capitalism, whether it's prone to some kind of breakdown or whatever, was always kind of uh, central to political education. It was a really central feature of the political debate. As I kind of suggested re reasons why, is that it seemed to be that a lot of the political conclusions people drew were very much centered on this interpretation of exactly how prone is capitalism to crisis. And my own um, initiation into Marxist politics, because I you know, really started reading Marx in 2007 and 2008, when the last great crisis rolled around was so centrally formulated by this. And I was kind of thinking that it's a strange situation and there's a chance that this is 
purely based on my complete misapprehension of what the nature of the debate is in the DSA, and maybe it's just because I'm scrolling the wrong Twitter feeds or whatever. But there's, there's a funny situation in which this uh, generation and this political movement has, is now already living through the second of its major crises in just over a decade. And while there is sustained conversation and analysis about crisis as such, there seems to be much less of a drive to connect it to this debate and to different accounts of Marxist crisis theory than there has been in political spaces to which I'm used to. And again, I would, you know, I'd be happy to hear from comment that I'm just completely wrong in, in throwing that out there. Um, and you know, one thing to say is that I don't think that this is necessarily an unhealthy dynamic because, because I see the old accounts of crises on which um, previous left formations were so dependent for their politics as essentially have been invalidated and indeed have been, having been invalidated by the recent crises from which we've lived through, I think this idea of detaching ourselves from um, the kinds of approaches to understanding crises that have dominated in the left before and approaching the current crises like I think we are doing successfully in so many ways, approaching all of the political questions that face us now in really novel and fresh and inventive ways that aren't necessarily restrained by traditions of left thought and left political culture that you know, might sometimes not always be so helpful, I think there's a potential opportunity here. I think there's a potential to readdress questions of crises uh, that aren't in, in, in the same way hinged to or dependent on theories that I think have been invalidated, right? which nevertheless, the fact that these theories are validated clearly haven't invalidated the fact that capitalism is crisis prone. Otherwise, we wouldn't be living through the second of these great crises in, in, in a little more than a decade. The point is we need to get to a point where we're re-theorizing crisis on the left, I think. And I think the starting point for that has to be openness to a much more ecumenical, pluralistic version of crisis, if you like. Right? So not assuming there's one central feature to capitalism, one inbuilt mechanism that's gonna drag it on this trajectory towards breakdown, but it, it essentially uh, being, being open to, to the awareness that there are multiple possible routes and sources of crisis under capitalism. Crises that stem from effective demand, crises that stem from financial collapse, both dynamics which I think were important in 2008. And very importantly, crises that stem essentially from exogenous factors and chief amongst these exogenous factors is the climate question, right? We're living through an, a, a crisis that was sparked by an exogenous factor now, the pandemic that threw this economy into crisis. There were underlying signs of malaise and unhealthiness in the economy, but it was this pandemic that was a trigger for it. And a lot of people are legitimately saying that, okay, yeah, this is one, but we're you know, plummeting rapidly towards the next one, which is gonna be the crisis that the system's thrown into by reaching the limits of this planet to sustain us. And so uh, really theorizing that and trying to draw out what that means for our politics is I think is central. There's one slightly unhealthy tendency that I've seen that where people I think just have swapped out this notion of breakdown. They've swapped out a tendency of the rate of profit to fall for ecological crisis. So it's still crisis, capitalism's you know, plummeting towards this point where it's just doomed, we've got to prepare for that. But now it's not a tendency of the rate of profit to fall, now it's ecological damage. I think that's potentially mistaken as well. I think, you know, there, there's every indication that capitalism is not going to get us out of this shit ecological situation before things really hit the fan and we're in dire circumstances. I don't think we should just safely assume that it's going to completely combust as a result of it. And I think there's enormously important work to be done uh, analyzing and trying to draw out exactly what are the implications of these new forms of crisis that we're going to be living through. Uh, very quickly on uh, decommodification, um, you know, I think, you know, again, we can kind of derive pretty easily from the description that I give, the cent description of capitalism that I put across of why de decommodification is central to left strategy. On the one hand, just because capitalist markets are prone to failure, right? They're, not, they're shown to be not really capable of delivering the things, the services, the goods that people need to live a decent life in a way that's 
fair and equitable and not prone to serious injustices. So we need decommodification simply because we need to provide for people properly. And then secondly, we need decommodification because the more we decommodify, the more power we directly take out of the hands of capitalists. Right? That was a portion of the conversation we didn't really get to. But all of the power that capitalists have derived from the power that they have over the production process and then the resources they get from it, which then determines investment and investment determines employment and employment determines the health of the economy. And so they use this instrument of their control over investment to dominate the political process and to browbeat politicians into their wishes and to say, you don't do what we want, we don't invest, people get unhappy and you lose votes. And so it's the, it's the fundamental weapon by which they dilute democracy is using the economic resources that they generate. And so the more we can de decommodify, take that power out of their hands, the better off we're gonna be. Um, okay, and then uh, quickly in response to Ashley's question, will it require drastic uh, change of living or no? So this is, I, I guess, boils down to a question of, can we be reasonably certain that any socialist, any planned economy that we create is gonna be dynamic in the same way that capitalism is dynamic or is it gonna end up uh, sacrificing all of this productiveness and this efficiency that capitalism's shown itself capable of producing. And as you say, this is favorite argument of proponents of capitalism. They want to tell you, fine, you can go for socialism, but the whole level of output in economic growth is going to go down that, you know, you might decrease inequality, but everyone's going to be well off. So can I do this? I think it can. Trouble is we just don't have an existing model that shows us how because the socialist economies, planned economies that did exist, they didn't succeed on this front, right? They managed to achieve high rates of growth for a certain period, which was basically what we call allocative efficiency. They were able to direct uh, resources in such a way that they were able to escape an early level of development, get initial leg up. The problem is they never showed any ability to compete with capitalism on equal footing in terms of what we call dynamic efficiency ensuring not just that you're allocating resources the right way, but that you are um, improving techniques of production, you're innovating constantly in the right way that you can keep up, that you're constantly expanding output as a whole, right? Not just allocating it in the right way. Uh, they, they didn't show an ability to do that. The thing in our defense is that that's not what we're striving for, right? We know that these economies failed for the most part. And I think that's, you know, as democratic socialists, that's a core thing in which we identify ourselves politically is that command economies of this kind did not work out because the command system itself was inefficient and because it didn't take advantage of the potential resource that any socialist economy is going to have to really leverage in order to compete with capitalism which is that we're going to have to take advantage of people's productive capacities from a system in which they actually want to work for its betterment out of positive incentives because everybody's better off with, from it, rather than one that they're dragooned into this by the power of capitalism and the control over the labor process, right? People have enormous capacities, creative capacities, capacities for work and energy and innovation. That if we can unlock that with incentives that don't depend on them dominating other people, that's the resource that a future socialist economy is gonna have to draw on. And at the moment, we're confined to making that argument theoretically because we haven't seen a system in which, it, um, in which it's actually been put into place. But it's an important thing for us to do. And I'll just say one final word without saying anything more is that I think one way that we should start to try to do that is not have the same hostility towards markets as such that previous socialists had. Markets are efficient systems. I think we can think of clever ways and socialists before us have thought of clever ways of using the efficient aspects of markets but detaching it from the facts of the features of markets that create inequities and injustices. So not using markets to distribute, but using markets to organize and coordinate our production. And I think that's something that could give us an advantage. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you guys for asking great questions. Thank you, Niall, for uh, your talk and for answering those questions. Um, and now we are getting to the most fun part. So nobody even think about leaving. Um, I'm going to pause the recording. Um, so